Hello. Today's video is part of a series of interviews I'm doing to help publicize the 2022 Conference of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. The conference is known as SICON, and it'll take place in Las Vegas from October 20th through the 23rd. Richard Wiseman is one of the speakers scheduled for SICON this year, and I'm happy to be able to talk with him now. Uh, my pleasure. And you, you, it's a very interesting day here. It is the hottest day in the UK so far. It is unbelievably hot outside. So um, greetings from a, a very warm UK. It, it, I hope you feel you are in an air conditioned environment there. Uh, yeah, we don't have air conditioning here. So uh, it, it's basically uh, we open the windows uh, and, uh, oh and we hope for the best. That's, oh that's my. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah actually, I was told a long time ago by friends who visited Ireland and uh, they wanted like ice in their uh, drinks and like, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm up in Scotland, so I'm in Edinburgh. Uh, so I'm in uh, way north. So it's not quite as bad, but down south, they've, they've got it very bad. So um, yes, uh, if, I, if I start to melt, uh, you'll know, you'll know well, what's going we'll understand. on. Yeah. Maybe we can do some post-production to fix that effect. So yeah, it yes. doesn't look quite so bad. Yes, so, or, or right. sell the footage to a sci-fi um, yeah. franchise and, yeah. uh, and do very well out of it. So for any viewers who don't know who Richard Wiseman is, let me read excerpts of the bio from the SciCon page. Uh, Richard Wiseman has been described by Elizabeth Loftus, a past president of the Association for Psychological Science, as, quote, one of the world's most creative psychologists. His books have sold over 3 million copies worldwide, and his psychology-based YouTube videos we'll talk about that later, have attracted over 500 million views. He holds Britain's only professorship in the public understanding of psychology and is one of the most followed psychologists on Twitter. The Independent of Sunday, a newspaper, chose him as one of the top 100 people who make Britain a better place to live. And Wiseman is a member of the highly exclusive Inner Magic Circle and has published over 100 academic papers, some on magic and illusion. His most recent book is co-authored with illusionist David Copperfield and explores the history of magic. It's called David Copperfield's History of Magic. And we just had that added to your Wikipedia article. Uh, let me also say that you're a CSI fellow. I don't know how they left that out on the CSI announcement. So welcome, Richard Wiseman. Pleasure. First up, Inner Magic Circle. Uh, and I also found out you're in something called the Edinburgh Secret Society. Very suspicious. Sounds very Illuminati-esque to me. What's that about? Uh, well, the circle goes back a long way. So the Magic Circle is based in London, and I should know the date it was formed. It's either 1902 or 1904, uh, but it's 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 in the past, and um, it's it's a very prestigious uh, magic club. It has its headquarters down there. And in fact, I chose to study psychology at University College London because it's the closest university to the Magic Circle. Uh, so uh, it's it's in the kind of King's Cross uh, Euston area. And so you, you join the magic circle as I did when I was, I think, 18 or 19. And then it has different degrees within it. And one of them is a member of the inner magic circle. I think there's about 200 of us uh, across the world. So, yeah, so that's, that's the magic circle. Uh, the Edinburgh Secret Society uh, was formed with a friend of mine, Peter Lamont. And for a while, we're not doing it anymore for various reasons, uh, logistical reasons, COVID and so on. But for a while, we held secret events uh, across Edinburgh. Uh, which were uh, folks would come along and, and see sort of magic and illusion and comedy and all sorts of things. So yes, I've I've done uh, done those sorts of things. And and also have to say, one of the top one hundred people that make Britain a better place to live. <laughs> Damn, I have no words. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, you read out that bio and I thought, my goodness, you can never live up to these things. Um, but uh, yeah, I try my best each day. I'm out there on the streets trying to make this country a better place uh, to live. Uh, I just I just greet people. Uh, I tell them jokes. Uh, I say, you know, how nice their clothes are. Anything uh, to try and make the country uh, a better place. And, you know, it's not working, uh, but I, I've got hope. That's the main thing. Hope is always good. Okay, so I'd like to start off talking about your appearance at this year's SciCon. Um, actually, let me mention the first time I encountered you was at SciCon 2017, my very first skeptical conference. Okay. I was in the front row as you interviewed Richard Dawkins. Oh my so, goodness, I remember that conference very well. Yes, uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah, it's fun. You remember me waving at you? Oh my goodness, I, I like it was yesterday. I knew I'd seen you somewhere before. And then I thought, yes, 2017, Richard Dawkins interview, you in the front row, <laughs> those little waves you kept doing. 
uh, they for, for me, they made the interview. I, thank you. So I don't recall all the details, but I do remember loving it. It was, so one, yeah, Richard was on very good form. He was, he was fun, yeah. Yeah, one of the things I do recall that, well, there's two Brits, uh, one of which I knew and one of which I didn't previously. I'm not going to tell you which is which. And uh, you had very different backgrounds and very different personalities, but the conversation was wonderful. Yeah, well, I interviewed Richard again, actually, with um, Ricky Gervais in, in London not, not so long ago. And, and that was interesting because there's three of us with very different backgrounds. Is that on YouTube? Uh, there. Uh, so, so, yeah, that, that's out there as well. Yeah, so it's, yeah, that, that was, and again, it was, you yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, R Richard, yes, I suppose like any of us, you know, it is that you're used to a certain type of interview in a certain way. And it's just kind of nice sometimes to do something a little bit different. And as far as I can remember that interview, we, we, we just kind of messed around for about 40 minutes or something. So yeah, it was fun. So this year you listed on the Psycon schedule as appearing twice. All right. The first yes. thing is a talk on your own as, and then as part of a panel. So let's talk about the talk on your own first. It's, it's named Investigating the Impossible. And I'm going to read the, the, the description. From magic to ghosts and telepathy to illusion, skeptics have long been fascinated by the seemingly impossible. In this talk, I will describe some of my adventures investigating these strange phenomena and explore how an openness to the extraordinary underpins some of humanity's greatest achievements. So an openness to the extraordinary, that's a fascinating topic. You want to tease anything more about the talk here? Yeah, so I, so I have a paper coming out, an academic paper coming out uh, in a few days' time uh, on it about... I just got very interested in, in what ties all of my different researches, research topics together. And I've done a lot of work on the paranormal, a lot of work on magic, more recently actually looking at the psychology of the um, uh, Apollo moon landings. And what I was fascinated by was this notion of the impossible, because magicians fake the impossible. Um, the paranormal, anyone who believes in it, often making a terrible mistake and thinking that something that is genuinely impossible is possible. And with the Apollo uh, moon landings, they took something that really was pretty much impossible and made it happen, the real. And, and so I became fascinated by that. And the talk is really looking at the impossible from different angles. It's saying, how come we've evolved to develop a brain that can represent so easily something that can't possibly happen in the world? You know, if you look at children's play, one of the first things they do is start to uh, create impossible events, fantasy play. We love sci-fi. We love fantasy. In our dreams, we have these impossible happenings. Magicians play on that and so on. And it's a completely neglected topic. And, and so I'm kind of bringing all that stuff together and really saying that it is crucial to humanity because what we have is this ability to imagine a seemingly impossible event and then sometimes have the tools and the ability and the optimism to make it happen for real. And those moments have changed the course of, of history. And in a sense, the paranormal is the price you pay for impossible stuff that becomes possible. So you, you, you can represent ghosts and ESP and all of those things. And that's sort of the price you pay for those few moments when you go, my goodness, I thought this thing was impossible and it really can happen. So it's, it's an interesting topic, and I hope it will be interesting, uh, the, the conference. And I say, it's, it's a kind of big wraparound for, for lots of research I've conducted over the years. That does sound fascinating. I hope so. So your, your second appearance is on a panel for an event listed as an honest liar. Um, I was a bit confused when I just read through the titles of, of the talks, and I thought, oh, they're just going to show Randy's uh, documentary, because that's the name of the documentary. So yeah. then I read some more. So let me read the event description. It's been two years already, wow, since uh, James Randi left us. In this special afternoon, in the company of some of the people who were closest to him, we will remember his work as one of the giants of skepticism and rationality. And it goes on. And, and they list the panel, including yourself. So how did you get involved with this part? Like how, you know, what was your relationship with James Randi? Oh, my goodness. I've known James um, many, many years through skeptical events. I, I, I didn't do all of the TAMs. But I did the majority of them and he came out here and I I was MC at many many events that, that James involved him and he was a kind of tremendous figure he's incredibly charismatic he knew magic he really knew magic uh, and and so it's a delight uh, to, to spend time with him and I can remember um, so I was in the documentary uh, that was one of the interviewees for it and so uh, it, it premiered in New York 
and we go over to New York for the, the premiere. And it's the weirdest thing because at the same time as it's on in this film festival, there's also, I think it's a biography um, or film about the life of Alice Cooper, the, the, the kind of rock star. And we're all sharing the same green room. And so half the green room is skeptics and magicians and the other half is rock stars that have spent their life on the road. And when you walked into that green room, it wasn't difficult to tell which group went with which film. And that's, that's all I'll say. Um, and then so we're all chatting and, and so on. Two very separate groups in this, this room with nothing in common, really. And then Randy comes in and because he's recognized by both groups, he toured with Alice Cooper. He did illusions with Alice Cooper. And of course, he's obviously we're with him because the skeptics in the film. So you forget that he's, he's kind of, he was proper showbiz. You know, he's, he's out there very, very well respected um, by, uh, by magicians. I have heard that story. And I think I saw the act on YouTube somewhere and didn't realize Randy had anything to do with it. So explain what part Randy had to play in it. In, in, in the Alice Cooper? Yes. Um, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, he beheaded Alice Cooper every night. So he, I think he played this kind of mad doctor who came on and chopped off Alice Cooper's head. So, uh, and, you know, he's, he's in happy days and, and, and stuff, kind of incredible. Um, so, yeah, huge fan. And, and I've had lots of lots of very happy memories of, uh, of Randy. And the documentary I thought was superb. I mean, really, really good. And so we're honoring Randy and we're honoring the documentary at the, the conference. Very exciting. So I, 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 other people on that panel, very, very exciting. I, I probably shouldn't say quite who's on it. I don't know if it's been announced yet. Um, yeah, yeah it's, in, it's in the list. I just remember okay. Uh, okay. his partner is, is there, uh, yeah. Davi. And Massimo Polidoro, who I'm also going to interview in, in one of these se segments. That okay. Give, give my love to Massimo. He's a he's, he's wonderful, dear friend of mine. Um, and, and so we're going to be playing in uh, clips of the, 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 the um, uh, documentary, talking to them. And, and it's, I, I guess, talking about how that documentary came to be, because it is a very exceptional um, uh, documentary. And, yeah, just talking about the, 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 the genuinely uh, amazing randy and and the role that he all played uh in our lives so um i'm really looking forward to it i'm really looking forward to it i i, I think it'll be great that sounds like it will be one of the highlights at one of the at one of the last conferences before the pandemic the whole room of skeptics put on randy beards and took a giant photo in his honor it was amazing he's no he was, he's extremely good performer he was he was great and uh i can remember i think i was in italy with him and we were outside the venue and he came up to me and he said, oh, Richard, I've got to and he started to tell me these stories and uh, they're very funny stories. And I said, yeah, that's very funny. He said, what do you think of this? Very funny. <laughs> and he walked in, walked straight on stage and did all the stories beat for beat, word for word, exactly as he'd done them outside. And I realized he was just rehearsing the stories outside <laughs> and trying to get them straight in his head and get the right beats and, and, and so on before walking out. So he's, yeah, he's wonderful. I saw him um, at that same, at the premiere, we did it, something very interesting happened, which is we went into, this was after the film, Randy and I walked into the room, which was gonna be a sort of meet and greet afterwards. And he went over to the table and I want to say what he did something sort of uh, that magicians a preparation for a magic trick. I won't say what it was because it would it would ruin the trick. He did some preparations for a magic trick. I saw him do it. And then he didn't mention the trick. And I'm with him for most of that time. Two hours goes by and he's, he hasn't mentioned this thing. I know he's set up for it. And then someone says to him, are you going to perform any tricks? And he said, no, I don't want to do any magic. And they, oh, come on, James, do some. No, I don't want to do it. Oh, my goodness. Well, somebody go and get me a napkin or something. And they go and get him a napkin. And he does this amazing trick with it. He'd been waiting for that moment for two hours. And, 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 and the fact that he's so set up for it means it's impossible to solve because you think, well, no one sit there for two hours set up for this. This That's exactly what he did. Um, so, yeah, no, it's great. It's a great mind. Great that mind. sounds great like a slightly less um, ambitious version of what a story, I believe it was Massimo, related about Randy at a previous conference where his escape from a, a jail cell in a real jailhouse was set up years in advance by him exploring the place. And then, then all the, the turnover and no one knew who he was when he came back to do it and they locked him up and he had prepared years in advance. No one could have done this. It must be he passed through the bars. 
Yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah. There's a magician called Molini, Max Molini. He was very famous for doing that. So whenever he went into someone's office, he would um, slip a playing card secretly behind a, a picture. If there's a picture on the wall, he'd slip a playing card there. And he might come back 10 years later and he knows there's a playing card now behind that, that, that picture and he'd do some amazing magic. So uh, yeah, no, preparation like that is, uh, is, is kind of incredible. I will have to try that on some of my friends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and now Massimo, Massimo's really, and Massimo's, I go a long way back, and he's responsible for the David Copperfield uh, book. Because last time I was at SciCon, which would have been the one you were at in 2017, Massimo had tickets to go and see uh, David uh, Copperfield perform. Uh, we were meant to go with Randy, but Randy unfortunately wasn't very well. Uh, and uh, so we couldn't come along. So I went along with Massimo. Uh, David Copperfield met us afterwards and said, oh, do you want to tour around the museum? He's got a huge secret private museum in Vegas. And we said, oh my goodness, that'd be amazing. So the next morning, I gave my talk at um, SciComm and then went on the tour. And it was during that tour that I thought of the idea of doing a book based on the amazing museum. So uh, it, it all goes back to, uh, to the event that you were at. You waving at me, I think, was, was crucial. Uh, in all <laughs> I appreciate the acknowledgement. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so everything's interlinked. Oh, wow. All right. So let's let's talk about since you're also a magician and a psychologist uh, and a skeptic. Let's talk about that a little bit. So Wikipedia says, in 2011, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry presented you the Robert B. Bell's Prize for Critical Thinking for Paranormality. Uh, Wiseman is not simply interested in looking at a claim. He's interested in showing us how easy it is for us to deceive and how easy for it to be fooled and to fool others. Um, so in, in my experience, maybe I'm wrong, correct me if you think this is wrong, but my, the conference speakers and also CSI fellows seem to be heavily weighted towards being in the physical and biological sciences, and you seem to be a sort of minority being a psychologist. Is that, is, first off, do you think that's true? I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true. I know what you mean, um, but you say Ray Hyman, psychologist, Jim, Jim Alcock, um, psychologist, uh, I'm sure there's lots of others. I'm thinking, I think Sue Blackmore is a uh, fellow psychologist. Matter, so, that's true. Um, I don't know who else is on that, that list at the moment. But so I, I think there's quite a few who are interested in sort of psychology of belief. Um, and in fact, I got into skepticism because of Sue. So originally, Blackmore. Blackmore. yeah, Sue Blackmore. Sorry, yes. So originally, uh, I was studying psychology, I was interested in magic. I was always skeptical about the paranormal. Um, in fact, recently I went back to my parents' house and I was clearing out all the books that I bought when I was like eight or 10. And they're all things like Bigfoot explained, UFOs explained. There's all this, this kind of skeptical stuff that was out there. So I was into that. But it never occurred to me to study it sort of as part of psychology because I thought, well, this stuff sort of isn't true. There's, there's kind of no psychology. And then I turned on the TV when I was, it must have been, I mean, soon I've spoken about this. I was probably about 20, 1920 and uh, eight years old. And Sue was on there and she'd just done some research into the psychology, why people believe this stuff. And I suddenly thought, oh my goodness, of course, there's a whole psychology behind people's experiences. And it seems very obvious now, but I didn't think about it at the time. And that really changed my direction. I, I, I got interested in uh, what, what psychop as it was then and, and, and so on. Uh, so Sue is another kind of big uh, sort of figure in terms of uh, changing my life. Yeah, so I, the question in this regard was, does psychology uh, and for you and the others you're mentioning, like does that kind of expertise and training give people with that background a special insight into skeptical issues that maybe people in the other sciences don't start out with initially at least? Well, I think you're used to dealing with, as a psychologist, ambiguous situations, ambiguous evidence. Uh, and, and, and if you're not comfortable with uncertainty, don't become a psychologist because psychologists don't like certainty. They always like saying, oh, there's another way of looking at it. You also get used to psychological methods, how you investigate stuff, control groups and demand characteristics and, and all those sorts of things, statistics and so on. I think that's that's helpful. I think the biggest thing, though, is you, you get to realize that you're wrong most of the time about pretty much everything. So, uh, you know, we, that, pretty much the whole of psychology rests on the notion, modern day psychology, that 
people's experiences aren't a great guide to reality that that they don't really understand how their minds work if we understood how our minds work then we wouldn't really need psychology and so psychologists are constantly going well you think you're a good observer actually you're not you think your memory is wonderful actually it isn't you think you're good at making decisions actually you're biased basically our brains don't work as good as we all think they do exactly exactly and then and, and and so they work pretty well most of the time but some of the time it, it, it's it's pretty dreadful and so you get used to that thought as a psychologist and it's a tiny leap from there to actually you think you've seen a ghost and you haven't you know you think your dreams have come true they didn't you know whatever it is you think so aliens think sucked you through the window and you know did probing on their spacecraft to you that's right and it, it turns out um they chose your neighbor uh, not <laughs> Um, and so uh so yeah so I, I think you get you get used to that that way of of thinking which is quite helpful thinking a way of thinking i think wow all right so yeah let's talk in that regard about science communication and i asked you know the grass tyson this just last week can you give me your thoughts on the importance of science communication especially in today's world yeah i, I can i mean I, I spent most of my life doing science engagement and getting people involved i think what's really important is we i don't know what what um neil said but i i think it's really important that people understand the process of science that science is never ever ever right it, otherwise it wouldn't change we don't sort of just go well, look, we, we've got this theory we think it's right we'll just close shop now that's the end of it what we're trying to do is get better and better approximations towards something which looks like the truth but you'll probably never ever get there. You're hopefully you're just better and more accurate than you were last week, last month, ten years ago, or whatever it is. And I think if people understand how science works, how scientists go about creating experiments, coming up with hypotheses, interpreting their results, and they realise the uncertainty within that, that would be a very big step forward when they should trust science and when they should question science. What we shouldn't do is sell science as this is the truth. Because the problem with that model is when it turns out that we're wrong the following week or we've got a better idea or whatever, people lose faith and go, oh my goodness, the whole thing. Uh, is it? So I think it's about, under for me, it's about communicating the uncertainty about science. It's an approximation. It's the best one we've got at the moment, but in the future, it will probably change because otherwise there wouldn't be any more work to be done. So that clearly needs to be taught in you know grade school um, because mostly you know my experience we just taught facts. This is A, B, and C about this subject. This is X, Y, Z about this subject. Not the critical thinking part. So, so how do you think we can improve education in, the, in this regard and you know get get people at an earlier age to understand uh, the role of science in the world? I, I think a key part is what's been lost a little bit in the UK. I don't know about the US, which is sort of hands-on doing experiments. You know, getting experiments are just naturally interesting. Doing something rather than hearing about somebody else doing something, I, I think, is is good. So finding out, you know, collecting your own data, um, then interpreting it, trying to fit it into a theory, realizing it might be wrong. All those things. The process of science is interesting when you get to do it. Just hearing about other people having done it to me isn't quite so interesting. So I would always argue for a much more hands-on approach to these these things. I remember being in a science fair when I was in grade school and I did and to my recollection everyone else did just basically went to encyclopedias and found out a subject and made big poster boards about it it was just regurgitating what was already thought about something yes. nobody that I know did any experiments yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean I, we used to when I was a kid doing sort of physics and chemistry and so on that was always the, the fun bit you used to try and sort of make as much mayhem in the chemistry class as, uh, as possible uh, but I, I think that that's interesting. I also think, you know, anomalies are very, very interesting. Counterintuitive stuff, it's what magicians are good at, actually. Scientific demonstrations that are counterintuitive. You think one thing's happened, actually something else does. And that teaches you that your experience, your intuitions about the world might be wrong. Um, and, and also, and the, the, the slight problem I think we've got at the minute is a lot of people have got on the science bandwagon without the credentials. And so, you know, people don't know who to trust anymore because everything sounds like science. So letting them know, you know, about peer review, about publications, about consensus, 
you know, just because you've got one scientist saying, I don't think this is true. If you've got, you know, 20,000 others saying, I think it is true, there's probably good reason to listen to 20,000, not one, and, and so on. So those sorts of things about the process of science, I think are, are very interesting. So, so one specific thing that's had a maybe yes and then maybe no thing recently, and uh, this is a psychological thing, so I want to ask you about it. And in fact, it just came up uh, at uh, the West Coast US had a, a skeptical conference over this weekend, virtual called Skeptical. Bill Nye was being interviewed and the backfire effect came up. So he was talking it up pretty promotionally. And then Eugenie Scott said, I don't know if that's true, Bill. And then they had some conversation about that. And, and Bill said, oh, maybe I'm wrong. I went to look on Wikipedia. And in fact, it says, the phrase backfire effect was coined by so and so and so and so in 2010. However, subsequent research has since failed to replicate findings supporting the backfire effect. The effect has been noted to be a rare phenomenon rather than a common occurrence. So, so what's your thoughts on that? What is the backfire effect? I have no idea what it is. Oh, maybe, no. Seriously, you haven't heard the term? I, mean, oh, okay. I, I, might, I might use a different term in the UK. Yeah, what, what, that's what I'm wondering. So, so it has to do with if someone has a strongly held belief, especially, or any belief, and you try to argue that they're wrong, they come out of that argument more firmly believing their initial position. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's like uh, belief, uh, perseverance, something uh, that, like that. Yes. I think it has been called that also. Yes. Okay. Um, so, well, what, two thoughts. One is people must understand the, 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 how important replication is um, within psychology and within science. And at the moment in psychology, um, there's a bit of what's called replication crisis. Lots of effects are not replicating. It sounds like this is, is one of them. And uh, funnily enough, that comes from parapsychology. So, so the weird thing is that Daryl Bem, who's a parapsychologist, published a study about precognition. I tried to replicate it. Other people did. And it didn't replicate. And then people looked at his data and his experiments and said hold on a second there's all sorts of issues here and then another group said oh, hold on a second those issues are also true in mainstream psychology as well so if you're going to pick on that stuff you should pick on mainstream psychology and let's see whether that replicates and it turns out lots of the main effects don't so weirdly it's one of the real benefits of parapsychology is it's, it's changed mainstream uh, psychology certainly at the moment um, in terms of that particular effect belief um, perseverance i think it's important to understand why we hold beliefs and often if people haven't formed a belief on the basis of evidence they're not going to change their mind on the basis of evidence because that's how they're not they didn't get into position in the first place like that i think we hold on to our beliefs because and form them because they make us feel good for the most part or they connect us with other people so we feel part of a group and if you're told well actually you're part of a really bright intelligent group we're the only ones that can see the truth well that that's a really you know attractive notion particularly if you're kind of a bit socially isolated and now you can go on the internet and you find other people that have got that belief as well now you're part of a community so i i don't know whether the I, I assume that if you start to give people information that's, that's counter their belief, what they try to do is kick back and hold on to their belief even more is one possibility, or it has no effect at all. Either way, you're probably not going to be friends at the end of that discussion. And, and so we, you know, we're normally talking to friends and family about these, these sorts of things. And if you walk away enemies, that's a complete disaster because that's the end of that, that, that those sets of interactions. So I think as a social psychologist, I'm more interested in how we change people's minds in a kind and gentle way and how we have the humility to say, well, maybe it should be our minds that should be changed as well. And so it was interesting, actually, because one of the things you said there is Bill Nye said, oh, maybe I'm wrong, yep. which, which is great, yep. which is, which is, is, is a very sort of sciencey position. And, but when I'm talking to, to friends and family and they do hold beliefs that, that I don't think are true, I always think, wh where did that come from? What work, to use the social psychology phrase, what work is it doing for you? Why are you telling me that? And can I present you with 
another group of people, another community, another way of feeling good and smart and positive that doesn't involve holding on to, to beliefs that I think might be harmful to yourself and others. And I think I naturally think like that because I'm a social psychologist and that's how we, we kind of think about everything is what, what work is it, you know, when somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you know, how are you today? You know, you're supposed to go, I'm fine. You know, and uh, you're not supposed to go, well, actually, it's been absolutely dreadful. And it's all a disaster and, and so on. We have these rules in place um, that, that, that kind of bond us all together. So, yeah, I, I always think, yeah, if I'd got beliefs about something and then people start presenting me with counter evidence, I, I'm probably going to kick back against it or I'm, I'm just going to defend against it and, and, and push it away completely. I just, uh, but what does change me is when... For example, you know, if you said to somebody, how certain are you on a one to, to seven scale? I don't know if psychologists like one to seven. On a one to seven scale, how certain are you about that belief? And let's suppose they give you a five, pretty certain. You go, why not a six? Why not a seven? Why have you not gone that high? And they'll start to produce the evidence about the uncertainty. Now, it's not coming from you, it's coming from them. And that's probably going to be far more persuasive than it's than it coming from and you. And then you explore that little bit further with that, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, th those are the kind of gentle kind of things that, that I would I would gravitate towards. Well, let me ask you about your investigation of paranormal claims. Uh, another part of Wikipedia on uh, your article says, Wiseman is known for his critical examination and frequent debunking of unusual phenomena, including reports of paranormal phenomena. His research has been published in numerous academic journals, various conferences, and featured on television. So what were some of your favorite investigations? And maybe did any of those have unexpected outcomes? No, they all had extremely expected outcomes, um, and they turned out not to be true. <coughs> and, uh, and because it was difficult for me, because I had one foot in the skeptics camp, but you know, my PhD was done at a department or a unit of parapsychology. So lots of my friends were parapsychologists or into this stuff. Oh, I was not aware. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, my PhD was at the Curse of the Parapsychology Unit, um, which at the time was run by Professor Bob Morris. Now, but Bob was really open-minded. So he, he, I, I, think, I think he believed in this stuff deep down. But he also knew there was lots of deception and self-deception. So he wanted a magician to, to work on that, which is how I got the position. But that meant that, I, I you know... Um, uh, Caroline Watt, who's literally next door, is a professor of parapsychologist, is my partner. We've been together for 20 years or whatever it's been. I should know how many. Um, and, and so when I did those investigations, it was socially quite difficult because often you were talking to friends and colleagues and it's the last thing they wanted to hear. When you go to, to, to skeptical conventions, it was easy because um, that was you know, preaching to the converted. Um, but no, so we, we looked at mediums, looked at psychics, looked at a psychic dog, did lots of ghost work. Um, a psychic a, dog? A psychic dog that could apparently predict when its owner was coming home. That was work uh, with um, a British parapsychologist, Rupert Sheldrake. And Rupert thought that the, the dog was psychic and I didn't. And we had a big sort of back and forth um, about it. So... I did ghost work at the Hampton Court, which is a royal palace, um, and then some other uh, work at various historic places. It was all fun and games, but I sort of, after about 10 years, stopped doing it for two reasons. One is that it just felt like I'd run out of things to investigate. And two is that it wasn't much fun. You know, it, it's that you're always arguing with, with people. Mm. And... Then it was around that time I was interviewing people about experiences, paranormal experiences and so on. And this person said um, about luck. And they said, I don't think I'm psychic, but I'm very lucky. And I, got, I thought that's interesting because I think we all have got thoughts about luck rather than the psychic stuff. And so I moved into looking at psychology of luck, which then became the basis for the Luck Factor book and took me off in the direction. Right. So yeah, let's talk about Quarkology. Uh, your YouTube channel with that title has 2 million subscribers approaching Kardashian territory. Uh, so, um, you know, I thought I was doing good with 10,000 Facebook followers. Um, you are. So, you so are. What, what is Quarkology all about? And where did that name come from? I think 
it, it, it was in a conversation with Michael Shermer. I'm, I, I'm slightly hazy about this memory, but uh, Freakonomics had come out. And I, I think I was chatting with Michael. I'm not certain, uh, but it was around that time. And uh, rather Freakonomics, uh, we're talking about the fact that, that I did quirky psychology and I came out with quirkology. And then we just happened to call the, the YouTube channel that. And that happened by chance, uh, the YouTube stuff. YouTube wasn't big when we were, were doing it. I mean, it was, it was big, but it wasn't absolutely huge. Um, I'd got this idea about an illusion, which was to do with what's called change blindness, the fact we don't notice changes in our environment. It sat in my head for about six months, I would think. Then one afternoon in the lab, we'd got an afternoon free. I just went outside and bought the materials for it. We filmed it, put it on YouTube, didn't think anything more of it, and it became a viral kind of hit. Um, and then I just started making more quirky, unusual psychology videos. And that was like 20 years ago. And it's so weird now because when I teach undergraduates who are 19, 20, they've been watching that stuff for their whole life. And some of the reasons why some of them do psychology, they come up and they go, oh, I got into psychology because of those videos. Oh, uh, okay. And at one, at one level, it's wonderful. At another level, it makes you feel a little bit old. <laughs> you, you kind of go, oh, right, okay. Um, so yeah, that's where, that's where it came from. And then the book came out. We did Luck Factor. I think Quirkology was the second book that I did, um, which was quite fun to, to put out. And then did 59 seconds after that, which was a, a, a sort of much bigger book. So all these things all happen by a chance. I mean, you know, if you think of you know, Massimo asking me to see David Copperfield or turning on the TV and seeing Sue Blackmore or this person I was interviewing talking about luck or, you know, the word Quirkology coming out. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, we, we like to think we're in control of our destinies and careers and things that I think we're, we're in a bit of a pinball machine, basically. So I saw uh, something about paranormal paranormality. Uh, yeah. How did it be self-published because publishers told you there's no interest in skepticism? Yeah, in, in America. In America, this was, yeah. UK was, was we had a big publisher, but uh, and it went all around the world, that book, but no one would touch it in the US. Yeah. It was the weirdest thing. And so I self-published it. And um, I love that book. It, it was, it's about the psychology behind each of these experiences and was, was quite fun to, to do. What, what book did you have the most and least fun writing? And by the way, um, uh, the 59 seconds. Uh, so Adrian Hill of uh, the Skeptic Zone fame, the uh, voice from Canada, mm. uh, asked me to ask you because she said that's, that, that book got her into the skeptical world. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's lovely to hear. Thank you. Uh, that was the, the quickest write of all of them. So I, a few things happened with that book. Um, the, it was a chance thing again. I went for a coffee with a friend of mine who's CEO, quite a big company. And she said, she wasn't very happy. said, what can I do to cheer myself up? I started to talk about the psychology of happiness. She looked at her watch and said, can you get on with it? I'm quite busy. I said, how long have you got? She said, about a minute. <laughs> and I thought, there are some things I can tell you in a minute about happiness. And so I okay, walked away and thought, yeah, but you can do the same with motivation. You can do the same with persuasion. There are things you can learn quickly. And so I went to see my publisher. I pitched that book and they didn't get it. They didn't, they couldn't get their heads around it. So I wrote the uh, outline for it. Then they got it. I went, oh, this is great. And uh, that book was written two and a half months, I would think. And when normally you're looking at six or seven for a book at least, it just like boom, came out. I just realized how much I've been collecting this stuff unconsciously in my head. So it's the quickest one to do. Um, and yeah, it still, still comes up. You know, Talking about the, the quirks in human memory, when Adrian wrote me this question to ask you today, she actually said, oh, the book is called Happiness in 59 Seconds. And then she corrected herself after looking it up, apparently. So wait a minute. Well, that was my bad memory. Yes. Yeah, no, 59 seconds. I think a uh, little change a lot, um, uh, which I can't remember where that came from. The bylines are very important on, on books. And we, we kicked around. With, I mean, originally it was going to be called The Magic Bullet, uh, which I did. I, I, I dislike that title immensely. Uh, then it was called 60 Seconds which was sort of all right, but you, 59 is a much more curious number. So that, 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 as soon, it's one of these things that as soon as you hear it, you know it. 
and and it, and in, in retrospect, it's like obviously it should be called Fifty Nine Seconds, but we went through a couple of months of endless lists of titles. So I, th I think Fifty Nine was the the most pleasant to to write. Yeah, it's, it's so fast. So let me ask you about a really out there thing I saw. I was just googling you in preparation for this, and it said you were the magic consultant for a stage version of The Twilight Zone. Yes. In the UK. That was my, one of my favorite all time series. So tell Thanks. us about that. What's, what's oh, that? so I'm such a fan of the Twilight Zone. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, I watched them all. I'm trying to think the number, I, th I think it's 143 episodes. It's something in that. Are you able to? to... Uh, there's a, I, I, it's something like that. I, in fact, when I first got Netflix, a subscription to that, and, and I don't know if it still is, but Twilight Zone was on there, I binged the entire set of years of, of every episode. Yeah, so I have them just over there, actually, every episode on DVD. Um, and they're so good, so good. And then they were going to do the show in London, stage version uh, of it. And there's only tiny bits of magic in there, but they wanted uh, consultants. Myself and another magician, Will Houston, uh, worked on it. And it was a blast. It was, it was lots of fun. Lots of appearing cigarettes, if I remember uh, correctly, because we had this sort of running gag through the, the whole thing that the, the characters kept having cigarettes appear in their fingers and uh and, and so, so did on. they did they repeat episodes or were they new scripts what was that about it was well so it's a tough show to do on stage um what they did was take and i'm not certain the number now either seven or nine i'm gravitating towards seven stories and kind of slice them up and you saw a bit of one story, then a bit of another, and so on. And you tried to put them together in your head. It was quite an experimental production in that that sense. So it was, uh, it was, it was and big parts of it were very faithful to the um, the originals. And the whole set was uh, monochrome, so it was all black and white, everything. Uh, and it was great. What yes, a great it would show. seem odd if it was in color, in fact. That's right. That's right. Yes. So what was uh, the magic part of it? What, what, what kind of magic? Well, I've, yeah, I've worked on quite a few shows as a magic consultant. So um, often it would just be a small thing. So there, for example, uh, everything was written. I'm uh, sorry, everything looked sort of that 1950s kind of look. And if you look on Twilight Zone, people are smoking all the, all the time. That was a big thing. Including the host, right? Sir. Inclu exactly, exactly. So what they wanted was just moments when cigarettes would appear and, and, and the character would just, uh, because the problem with putting magic into a play is it doesn't normally fit. So a magic thing, you have to believe. If I put a coin in my hand, you have to believe the coin is in my hand and then it vanishes and that's fine. If that happens in the middle of a play where you're suspending your disbelief, you know it's not the 1950s and you're watching the Twilight Zone, it trips audiences up. And the worst thing that can happen is you put a magic trick into a play and it gets a round of applause. It's a disaster because then now everyone's back in reality and out of the, the suspension of disbelief. And so I think magic has to be done very, very carefully in a very light touch in most plays if the, you're still trying to keep the audience in, in the, the, the kind of suspension of disbelief. It's an entirely different psychology to a magic show. You go along to see David Copperfield, you need to believe everything is actually happening in front of you. And, and, and that's very different to go and see a play where you know that these people are playing a role and so on. So uh, Leonard Trammell, who you may know, uh, asked yeah. me to ask you what new projects you're working on or books. Well, um, I've, I've written, I just written a book called uh, Why Psychology Matters, which is a book really for psychologists and undergraduates about why psychologists do what they do. So it's inviting everyone to take a step back and say, why are we doing this research? Is it just for publications? Is it just for grants? Or are we doing psychology that is really relevant to people's lives? And so it's a, a kind of call um, for students in particular to do more relevant uh, psychology. So that one's coming out. However, uh, we also have, I'll be talking about this in Vegas, uh, Hocus Pocus, which is a, um, uh, a comic uh, which I've uh, put together uh, with Rick Worth and uh, Jordan Culver. Jordan is the artist, Rick is the writer. And it's a comic which is about scepticism and magic and the paranormal because it's really hard to get stuff which is in this form, which isn't all kind of pro the paranormal. 
most of these things are fictitious uh, stories for pro paranormal. So these are all non-fiction stories, bits of history, um, and there's five of them. Number five is coming out uh, very soon. And yes, we have a very exciting project where we're, it's mainly UK based, but we're going to be taking that to uh, America very soon. So uh, very exciting. Are you going to be part of the book signing uh, at Psycon for this? I hope so. I'll, I'll, I'll sign anything. No, I don't sign my own books, just anybody else's books. I'll, I'll sign those, anything, basically. Maybe you could sign Richard Dawkins' uh, book for me because I had him sign one and, and it could have been the mailman signing it. You cannot read his signature. <laughs> a bit like that actually so uh, <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> all right so i have a few wrap-up questions uh what are you looking forward to most about uh, attending psycon this year it well it's always fun i mean i i've attended lots of tams attended lots of uh psychons seeing seeing lots of people i haven't seen for a long time finding out what everyone's been up to and also um quite frankly after the last two and a half years just being in the room with other people <laughs> it's <laughs> will be good um you know I, I think one of the interesting things about the pandemic is we've realized you know how much how important face-to-face -face interaction actually is so yeah just I, I think it'll be the first big skeptics conference I've done for about two and a half three years wow okay so and on that note I think we can wrap it up for today thank you again for your time it was great to talk with you today uh and I'm looking forward to hopefully meeting you in real life at Psycon in Las Vegas yeah, sit in the front row and just wave uh, during the talk. <laughs> then I'll know it's you. <laughs> now, I'm looking forward to meeting you and everyone else uh, at the, uh, the conference. Thank you. Thank you.